Okay, I'm going to get us going right here. And today's uh, speaker is Amy Rosemont from University of Georgia. And Amy uh, got her PhD at Vanderbilt University uh, and uh, is, has been a, well, she is a professor at the Odom School of Ecology at the University of Georgia and was the assistant director of the Institute of Ecology. Uh, she is the uh, recent past president of the Society for Freshwater Sciences. And past president is actually somebody that has some responsibility still. Can't get away too easily on that. Um, and one of the things she's doing right now is she is the project director of a program called Emerge, which is um, broadening the participation by undergraduates, uh, graduate students, and uh, early career uh, scientists. Um, and it's a really nice program. Uh, one of my uh, students from Haskell who's working in my lab is uh, uh, participating in it. And they're actually having a, uh, I think it's a three-day float trip uh, as part of it. Uh, but- uh, All come, as we like to say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's at, um, it's gonna be in Grand Rapids. It's a uh, Jasmine or something like that. It's joint aquatic sciences meeting with a bunch of other societies. Um, uh, Amy is an uh, uh, ecosystem freshwater ecologist. Uh, she's published on uh, about 100 papers or so, um, bioscience, ecology, uh, ecologia, and a variety of other places. Um, and so she's going to talk today about global change effects on stream ecosystems, stories of loss and recovery. And then tomorrow, uh, there is going to be a 12 o'clock sem uh, seminar um, at... Um, uh, off on the central campus, what's the name of that building? Purge, uh, room C, I think it is. At so, noon. At noon tomorrow. So make sure you be there. Go ahead. <laughs> I'd love to see you again. Uh, and thanks a lot for coming out today. I know everyone's time, especially this time of the year, is super precious. And I want to thank Jim for being a host and for this super special invitation. Uh, the collaborators and particularly my students that provide things that I can talk about. Um, it was especially um, meaningful and poignant for me to be asked in 2020 to give the Armitage lectures uh, and then to learn that Dr. Armitage passed away just this past January. And um, so I uh, learned a lot about his life, read some articles, the loving obituary that had been written about him and I learned that he started life in Steubenville, Ohio, uh, straight out of high school, went into the army, used the GI Bill to attend Bethany College and then graduate school at the University of Wisconsin. This was the start of his life. And then he embarked on all these research projects, Antarctic lakes of all things, marmots, animal behavior, and then here, all things KU. Uh, and so what uh, happened, what emerge from his life is that, you know, lots of awards, publications, he was known for his leadership in undergraduate education, building field stations and fields of animal behavior, ecology, and mammalogy. And so in the end, we, we see the, um, this amazing life that was well lived and very accomplished. And like every story, the story of Dr. Armitage's life has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And um, in storytelling, we know this as the synthesis or the way things start. The antithesis is where all the action and drama takes place. And then the synthesis is where all that dramatic action comes together and gives rise to those emergent properties that we see um, come at the end of the story. Uh, and what I would like uh, to do today is tell you a story about streams. And so we'll start by talking about how streams function in general. In our case, um, what they're doing in terms of meeting human needs for food, water, and energy. And the antithesis is sort of where we're at now and what streams are facing in terms of global change effects of nutrient pollution, rising temperatures, contaminants, 
we alter the flow, we see, um, as Keith Guido's work and Jim's work as well shows, losses in biodiversity. Uh, but the end of the story is still untold, and that's something that we still have in our hands. Uh, what we see in a life like Dr. Armitage's and his story is that it's really the qualities and the activities that this protagonist has engaged in that give rise to those emergent properties. So what are the actions, the qualities, the values that will be used as we address how streams are doing now that will tell the rest of their story? So what I'll cover is uh, the thesis of how rivers work. This is just the frameworks that I've learned and, and that I teach to others about how streams generally function, how they function. Um, but antithesis, how do stressors affect rivers? And what I wanna do is give examples of the long-term experiments that my colleagues and I have done testing the effects of nutrients and temperature. These are two of the biggest stressors uh, in rivers and streams. And to tell you what we have found in terms of the effects that they have uh, on rivers. And then the important part is for us to figure out how we can ensure a better future. What did we learn from our work that gives us uh, the ideas and the qualities that we want to embrace as we go forward uh, so that streams can you know, be restored and continue to give to people in future generations. Well, one of my favorite papers that I use for describing a framework for how streams work is by Jill Barron and colleagues. It was written about 20 years ago, and it goes through uh, these five elements of functioning freshwater ecosystems. The flow regime, got some water quality variables, the biota, but our goal is that we have functioning aquatic ecosystems that are providing both short and long-term goods and services, well, here's the long-term, and can adapt to future stressors uh, like climate change. So those five elements, what we need are building blocks for these functioning systems are the flow regime, we think about the sediment or organic matter inputs. We think about the temperature regime, contaminants and nutrients, and what biota are supported. So as I describe our experiments, I'll talk about nutrients and temperature affecting organic matter processing and also how biota are affected with those interactions. And I wanna make the point that organic matter terrestrially drives stuff that comes into streams from floodplains and um, forest, prairies, is important in all kinds of streams and rivers. So these are suburban to urban rivers. Uh, some students in a class I teach, uh, my sister and her spouse canoeing um, just three weeks ago in South Georgia. So all kinds of streams and rivers have that this terrestrially derived stuff as important for uh, habitat and nutrient uptake. This has been tested a lot at the Coweta Hydrologic Lab. I'll talk about this place. It's heavily forested, but again, I want you to expand your thinking about what organic matter is, anything dead that enters a stream or river and is playing a role in the food web or as habitat. Uh, but at Coweta, this really amazing experiment was conducted where my colleagues, Bruce Wallace uh, and others, cut the forest uh, off from the stream to say, what happens to the stream when we restrict the input of all the organic matter? And we see that this stream is looking um, a bit bare. And I'll just show you some of the experimental results from those experiments, uh, because I feel like they told us a lot about what drives stream life with those forest inputs. So this paper was published uh, in 97, 
secondary production of the macroinvertebrates. So the macroinvertebrates, as you know, hopefully because you've taken, you've looked under a rock in a stream, they're really the center of action. They are feeding on uh, primary producers, this dead organic matter, and then they are food for higher consumers. And what happens to their production when you exclude litter? In this experiment, the pre-year was uh, these, the exclusion and the reference stream, and then three years of that canopy, and we see that production increased in the reference stream, but declined in the exclusion stream. So a uh, fairly convincing evidence that uh, this was a driver of secondary production. Uh, but these folks didn't stop there. Uh, the, uh, I'm sorry that this, um, I doubt it. Anyway, <laughs> macroinvertebrates, they love organic matter. And so what went on in this series of studies is that here we have monthly invertebrate biomass on the y-axis. The reference stream is this red stream. And in the blue stream, they kept removing things, small wood, large wood, put in PVC, put in fast litter, put in slow litter. And these bugs responded. Biomass went down and then it went up according to how much organic matter uh, was being put in the stream. This shows you how coupled the primary consumers are. Uh, so things like mayflies and caddisfly larvae on the x-axis, macroinvertebrate predators like this odinate larvae on the y-axis. And here's when you have organic matter that's high. This was the reference in the litter added streams. And here's where litter was removed. So low, production of both those primary consumers and their predators, but they were coupled. They go up together when they, um, when organic matter was added in these experiments. So let's go where no carbon has gone before this cave stream. So this was, to me, this amazing experiment was conducted by um, the Narski, who was a post of uh, graduate student with John Benstead at University of Alabama. And they said, okay, let's go to a system that has no carbon at all. And we'll backpack in bales of hay and we'll put it in this cave stream. And what's amazing um, from this study is that from caves to the Coweta streams, these all fall on the same axis, showing that organic matter, ash free dry mass and the benthos so here we're just going to scoop this stuff out of the stream. How much organic matter mass is there? It is going to predict how much invertebrate biomass we see. So here are the cave streams, these open symbols, reference and free addition. Uh, these solid symbols is, are the cave streams where they added organic matter. Here are surface is those forested Coweta streams. So the surface reference streams are way up here. They have a lot of organic matter, a lot of bugs. And then surface exclusion, these diamonds, it's where they did the litter exclusion study. So that's where I want to start by saying, wow, that organic matter is super important to stream life. And also things like nutrient uptake, things like habitat. So you can, my colleagues kid me, they're like, Amy, you need a slogan like save the detritus. So let's go, um, this antithesis then is sort of like what's happening to streams now? What do we know about the effects of stressors? And uh, uh, the place that we start is that 44% of US streams are considered in poor condition and that nutrient pollution is a major stressor. So the US EPA just started to embark on these national rivers and streams assessments that they're going to do every five years. And this last one where the sampling occurred in 13 and 14 just came out in December of 2020. 
only 44, well, only 30% are in good condition. 44% of streams are considered in poor condition. Also, stream temperatures are rising. This is a paper from 2010 uh, by Sujay Koshal and others from streams around the US, Pennsylvania, Montana, Oregon, Washington, DC, showing that there are increases in stream water temperature that we're already seeing do a lot to land use change because as we um, remove the forest, riparian vegetation, stream water temperatures increase. And uh, this illustration is from a perspective paper that my colleague John Kamenowski and I uh, wrote in 2012, where we said, okay, Barron is telling us that we need biota. What we need to support aquatic life is the base of the food web. So we need the right quality and quantity of algae. We need the right quality and quantities of that benthic organic matter. And lots of different kinds of land use change, deforestation, uh, warming, adding nutrients, all those affect, we would say, wow, there's more algae here when we remove the canopy. As we um, increase high flows, we're gonna blow out the organic matter and things that are retained in streams. So uh, much of these land use change impacts are on uh, that food web base. Uh, also, I'll uh, use this terminology. When I say detritus, you say detritus. No, um, I'm meaning it's that dead organic matter that has bacteria and mostly fungi that have colonized it. They're the things that are making it um, nutritious, nutritious for the macroinvertebrates. So I want to talk about what we have determined in terms of our long-term nutrient enrichment experiments. And one thing that um, was, let me, I'm just gonna see if I can move this. Yay. Um, obvious to me when I started to do these, why I thought it was important to look at these brown pathways was that nutrients are affecting algae and detritus in fundamentally different ways. Now my animation's not working. My, um, my ability to move these slides is now done. Huh? Yeah, right, correct. Oh, oh there we go. Yay, so, so you can see that these boxes go get big and get small. So when we add nutrients with plants, they grow more and we get more carbon. But when we add nutrients and we're fueling bacteria and fungi that decompose organic matter, we get less carbon. This has been super important to sort out exactly how that works. And that's been a lot of the work that my lab has done, as well as others around the world. Uh, and it has a lot to do with peanut, butters, peanut butter and crackers. So what happens when there's stream water, nitrogen and phosphorus, fungi and bacteria take that up. And so they're the peanut butter, they're the things that are more nutritious to a macroinvertebrate than the leaf or piece of wood uh, that's the cracker they are making that detrital resource nutrient rich. Then how does it decompose? It's either gonna be through microbial respiration of CO2 and or the shredders are feeding on that material and turning it into fine particles and it moves downstream. This symbol I'll use for fungi is a fungal spore. They're in the water column and they stick on leaves and they start growing their mycelia. So this concept of how long carbon is retained in streams is super important. 
And so what we measured in our experiments was this carbon residence time, which we could get as the inverse of this exponential loss rate of carbon. And you know, it's how long some particle of carbon stays in a stream reach before it moves downstream. So this can be on the order of days, months for things like dead leaves, years in the case of wood. The experiments that we did to examine a lot of these effects of nutrients were done at the Coweta Hydrologic Lab it's here on the border between Georgia and North Carolina. That's the Coweta Basin. And we did whole stream experiments. We had some experiments in streamside channels. We had um, my colleague, Vlad Gulas, is a microbial ecologist and lots of cool stuff in um, liquid media. I'll talk about the whole stream experiments first. And we conducted two in different parts of the Coweta Basin, uh, experiment one, experiment two over here. And this hydrologic lab has been the geographic base of the long-term ecological research site is also a USDA Forest Service facility. These two whole stream experiments, this shows uh, David Manning who was then a doctoral student, and John Kamenowski, who's then a postdoc. They both have great jobs now working on our dosing infrastructure. In experiment one, we had two paired streams. We had one as a reference, and we continuously enriched one, the other one, for five years with nitrogen and phosphorus at red field ratio. In experiment two, we went to five streams, and we collected pretreatment data for one year. And then we dosed all five streams with different ratios of N to P for two continuous years, asking more about, you know, is it nitrogen or is it phosphorus that gives us um, a response in these uh, stream ecosystems? It wants me to check in with it now every time I. So here's Coweta, bird's eye view. We're there in the Southern Appalachian Mountains. And these are the watersheds of these two whole streams that we initially uh, studied, 1998 to 2000, two pretreatment years, and then five years of continuous nitrogen and phosphorus enrichment at moderate concentrations. I'll show you a graph that shows just how low micrograms per liter our nutrient enrichments were compared to what we're seeing in streams around uh, the US in uh, human modified landscapes. And what we observed in this first experiment is we are going out every month and measuring leaf litter standing stocks in these streams, multiple transects, and we get the mean of that per month. And we would plot how much leaf litter there was in the uh, reference stream and the treatment stream before we added nutrients and then after. Uh, and so this was to measure how fast is that stuff going in the reference versus treatment stream. And what we found, you can see the treatment here. Um, so we get peak uh, leaf inputs around December and they decline through the summer. And then the summer it gets kind of a dicey time to be a bug because there's not much organic matter left in the stream. And in our treatment stream, you'll see that we started getting lower faster every year and reaching lower um, amounts of organic matter when we were adding nutrients because the microbes were stimulated and decomposition was happening and we were losing that organic matter in the stream. To show you how we measured these exponential decay um, functions, we took, for instance, year four here, and um, we just took the natural log of that mass remaining from that peak amount and we calculated um, K, a decay function just like we would in a litter bag in a stream where we give a certain amount of organic matter and then look, see it um, decline over time. And so what we found, the uh, one over K is the carbon residence time. So 
in this year four under reference conditions, residence time was about four months. And in the treatment stream, that residence time was about two and a half months. So just adding these moderate concentrations of nutrients um, really accelerated decomposition and reduced residence time. So let's go to experiment number two. These were our five streams in this other area of Coweta, each enriched at a different ratio of nitrogen to phosphorus. So this shows our crazy experimental design. Um, our two to one stream to our 128 uh, to one stream means that our phosphorus range from 11 to 90 micrograms per liter. Our nitrogen um, from about 80 to 650 micrograms per liter. Again, these are pretty uh, low to moderate concentrations relative to the landscape. To show you that our studies are shown in this blue box, the pinkish box is from data around the Southern Appalachians that shows the range in nutrients observed there. And then David Manning had put together this figure based on uh, NAQA data, uh, US Geological Survey data showing just um, those concentrations in landscapes across the US. And experiment two, we're out there in the woods, we're dosing these streams 24 seven, all kinds of conditions. Uh, and we just had, um, in order to distribute this along our whole reaches, we used irrigation line and these little um, irrigation ports to distribute our nutrients. So these ex two experiments had spanned 15 years and they were some of the um, wettest and driest years on record at Coweta. And at this point, we had 27 annual measurements of those carbon loss rates and the corresponding average nitrogen and average annual phosphorus concentration um, in these streams. And we plotted this all together and it literally gave me goosebumps. I initially had looked at um, just this, the second experiment and was presenting at a, at a SFS meeting and a colleague said, well, Amy, you've got, you've got that data from experiment one, why don't you just plot it all together? Um, and it turns out that we can explain, so here on this axis are these stream scale litter loss rates. And then here's phosphorus and here's nitrogen. And as both of those increase, this is when these K rates are the fastest, we get the greatest decline. Um, but we could explain 83% of the variation in these whole stream carbon loss rates just with nitrogen, phosphorus, temperature, and discharge. Uh, so this was, um, this was a science paper um, that I um, just felt super gratified that all the work that my students and colleagues uh, and I had done, you know, it's like, here it is ecology, it's field ecology. So that made it particularly gratifying. But, uh, you know, this is a process that we can't see with our eyes. We think of, you know, nutrient pollution and there's, you know, the biggest scourge is cyanobacterial bloom. And another scourge is just things getting slimy and changing food webs. But loss of this detrital organic matter, we haven't been able to see. And I think just doing things on this scale helps show uh, that this can be important and it's a large magnitude effect. So in this case, over all of our streams, reference and the treatment, um, we saw a 55% reduction in those residence times. Five and a half months is what a typical leaf gets to live in a stream. Um, but with added nutrients, in this case, it was two and a half months. So uh, that's all that mixed litter that's coming in from the forest. And so one thing we wanted to know is how vulnerable um, 
long residence time carbon sources are. Do the nutrients have the same effect if it's typically a fast decomposing or slow decomposing leaf? And so we tested this with um, red maple, which is nutrient rich just in its litter quality and typically breaks down relatively fast and rhododendron leaves that are like the really bad crackers. Like, I don't know, the, I love those big stone wheat thins, but they're kind of crunchier than some like buttery cracker. Um, so what's going on um, across litter types? And this is Vlad Gullis and his student, Tim Burns, doing something else in our streamside channels. So we conducted experiments just with our pecan bags um, in the streamside channels, and we tested, well, how, how fast do nitrogen and phosphorus break down red maple versus rhododendron? And we uh, got these same models showing a additive effect of nitrogen and phosphorus. So we tend to ask ourselves, is it N or is it P? You know, in this case, it's um, co-limitation, and uh, we see that, you know, the highest breakdown is when we have the highest concentrations of N and P together, uh, but one thing that was interesting was that the response in rhododendron was twice as much as the response in red maple. So we're getting this information that these low carbon, um, high carbon, low nutrient content resources respond the most when they get added nutrients. Uh, so we wanted to probe this a bit more. Uh, and David Manning, who did just an amazing job in his dissertation work. Um, so this is tailgate science, I guess, because we're at University of Georgia. And we have our pecan bags. And we put these, this was an experiment too. So we had three stream or five streams, three years, litter bags of red maple, tulip poplar, chestnut oak, rhododendron, and these wood veneers, which we buy from someplace in Brooklyn. And you know, they're as good as a popsicle stick for measuring wood decay. And we put these in the, um, under pretreatment conditions and under nutrient enriched conditions in all the streams. And our hypothesis was that, hmm, is there something, you know, some aspect of the litter that we can link what the response would be in terms of how it responds to nutrients? And so initial carbon to phosphorus in that leaf litter, we thought should be aligned with the response to enrichment. And remember how this works is that, well, I guess I didn't tell you this part, that the fungi and bacteria, uh, if they're on a surface in a stream, they're either gonna grab the nutrients from the water column or they're gonna get them out of the leaf. And so if you don't have a lot of nutrients in the leaf, you might really like those nutrients that are coming in in the stream water. And so um, that was sort of the basis for thinking that we would see this relationship. And in fact, it was a, uh, you know, pretty well aligned with, this is the response ratio, how much these different litter types broke down under our enriched two years versus pretreatment. In the case of rhododendron, we accelerated those breakdown rates were four times under enrichment scenarios than they were in pretreatment. For our wood veneers, they were six times as great under enriched conditions um, than pretreatment. And um, the red maple, tulip poplar, and chestnut oak, two to three times um, magnitude change due to enrichment. So that's telling us also that the biggest effects of these nutrients are on substrates that are the most nutrient poor. They have the longest residence time. And so now when I go to a stream that has a lot of wood and I think, oh, that's great habitat for fish. I wonder what the nutrient concentrations are in that stream or river because that is 
is contributing likely to the breakdown of that material. This has a lot of complicated stuff on it, but bear with me um, because David Manning did a whole lot of work <laughs> to, to tease this out. How much did um, this, the losses in these leaves due to microbes um, balance with how much was being lost due to shredding invertebrates? And in these streams where there's a lot of shredders, it turns out that that balance, they both were contributing about the same pretreatment, but with nutrient enrichment, the shredders started to do a whole lot more even than the microbes. So this shows for these four different litter types, here are pretreatment relative shredder to microbe breakdown. And this dashed line is when those two things are equal. So maple, oak, rhododendron, shredders were already doing a lot. Uh, tulip poplar, these two things are kind of balanced, but with nutrient enrichment, this red line is where shredders are having two and a half times, 2.7 times the effect that microbes have. And so when we add nutrients, those shredders are doing a whole lot more. That means that they're getting in there, feeding on this stuff, accelerating that loss, and could ultimately be, um, mean food limitation um, for some shredders. So what are we losing with nutrients? Just to sum this up, we're losing how much detritus we have because we're accelerating those loss rates. We're especially losing recalcitrant carbon substrates that's important for so many things, but um, particularly for nutrient uptake, I think is an important point because Whenever we have that organic matter, it's a site for nutrient uptake. If nutrients are accelerating that loss, we set up conditions where there, is, there are even more nutrients going downstream. And we see that we really increase shredder carbon demand. Uh, and so where does that leave production of stream life? They like those nutrients though. So, so let's look at, um, rising temperature just a little bit. Um, and then I wanna wrap up with our synthesis because the most recent experiments we've been doing are to examine some of these same pathways. What are the fates of organic carbon in streams when we increase temperature? Is it, um, how much does it stimulate fungi and bacteria? How much will we lose in terms of CO2 due to microbial respiration and there's lots of evidence that shredders might not do so well in warm streams. And so is there more shredder loss or is there not so much shredder loss? All of these, if you've taken an ecology or biology class in the last 20 years, you've probably heard uh, Jim Brown's work, Metabolic Theory of Ecology. And this gives us like, here's our prediction. Is this what we're actually seeing empirically? And so what Jim and others work has shown that things from, is it root decay, lots of metabolism of different organisms that when we plot it against one over um, degrees, Kelvin, I always forget, um, that we get this slope, this magic slope of 0 0.6 or 0 0.7. So if, we measure this in nature and that st slope is steeper, that means that's gonna respond more to temperature than we would predict from MTE. If it is, um, the slope is less steep, there's not gonna be that much change with temperature. So we've been exploring this um, with the usual methods. We actually are warming a whole stream. We just ended that um, with electricity. John Benstead at the University of Alabama has been the lead PI on this. So I didn't have to worry, worry about the mechanics of this so much. Um, and we're also, we've been using our streamside channels and we're also using the landscape gradient at Coweta through time, through the seasons and due to elevation and aspect, 
Uh, and so one thing I wanna show you is that we've been putting litter bags in all these places over time, and then just using that temperature gradient to tell us what a breakdown rates look like across all these temperatures. So this is work that Carolyn Cummins, who is a doctoral student in my lab has been doing. And we have our usual suspects, Acer, red maple and rhododendron leaves. And what Carolyn has plotted is the uh, breakdown rates against the centered inverse temperature to look at these slopes of microbial decomposition, which is in fine mesh nitex bags, and then shredder breakdown is the blue dots. And here are the activation energies down here. Uh, but sh the shredder response is steeper than the microbial response, and it's steeper than MTE. So we need to sort of flesh out what that means. But in fact, that means that in this case, MTE is not accurately predicting. If, if we want to say here we've got this carbon, the stream network, the Little Tennessee River, what's going to happen to that stream carbon as temperatures warm? Can we just use MTE? Well, if we've got shredders, they're telling us that that's going to be a steeper response than, than what MTE would predict. As I said, there are um, there's data showing on a biogeographical scale that shredders don't like warm temperatures. And so whether that plays out over longer terms uh, is something that needs to be in our predictive models as well. We also got to do stuff in our streamside channels. Um, John Benstead had this fancy infrared camera to capture our different uh, temperature treatments there. Carolyn did some growth studies of shredders in the streamside channels and found, um, this was for, I'm misrepresenting the shredder, it was actually Caliperla, which is a little more um, rounded stonefly, fed on red maple leaves and rhododendron leaves. Rhododendron was a little bit not so, you know, straight increasing and then super high variability at our highest temperature treatment. So no effect of growth when the shredders were fed rhododendron leaves, but a positive effect of growth on shredders fed red maple leaves. Carolyn also looked at development, uh, developmental rates, how fast their wing pads were coming on and saw some really interesting things there. So just I've just given you a brief sketch of our temperature work. Again, that's going to accelerate the loss rates of these detrital resources. The fact that those shredder contributions to mass loss were greater than MTE uh, gives us pause and um, means that that prediction might mean that it's we'll see greater losses than we would predict with MTE if if our result are rigorous, uh, that, that Carolyn observed the shredder growth rates increasing with temperature. And so you have to say, well, the, the carbon's going down and the demand's going up. So again, thinking about ultimately what's happening in terms of food limitation. Because uh, in, the, in the forest streams that we're studying, um, all the carbon comes in at once. It's a donor controlled system. So it's, the forest says, here you go. That's all you're getting, and y'all have a great time. Uh, and so what we've seen in our longer term experiment is a real shift in the food web uh, after a certain number of years, because certain bugs could get in there and exploit that those leaf, um, leaf carbon and other invertebrates were not able to be um, sustained. Longer lived, the ones that depend on it in the summer when it gets really low. So I would say what we're seeing across the landscape too is widespread nutrient pollution. And I'd say what we're setting ourselves up for are streams that are more uh, nutrient rich 
and uh, carbon poor. So how do we take this work and um, develop ways to understand streams and rivers so we can manage them better for the future? I borrowed shamelessly this title from that Thomas Friedman uses in a book called Hot, Flat, and Crowded, Why We Need a Green Revolution. And used his book cover and I said, streams and rivers are predicted to become hot, flashy, and eutrophic. Um, what needs to be done to conserve and renew stream health? So this paper that John Kamenowski and I wrote emphasizes that we need to support freshwater ecosystems from the bottom up. We need to make sure that the food quality and quantity is there to support stream life. And so some of our management can be geared towards algal resources, detrital resources, and the extent that they are supporting um, macroinvertebrates and fish and salamanders. So I, again, I'm just, I need a t-shirt with this, I guess. Um, detritus is the greatest. Um, and this was a um, not well-known study, but I think it's really convincing to show what organic matter can do in a stream is a, was a restoration study in Australia. They looked at percent uh, SRP retention in these streams. They were in urban streams, so they had really low organic matter, and then they dumped in like 20 grams per meter squared of organic matter. So in this treatment stream, they were a little different in how much SRP was retained under preconditions. But when the leaves were added post in the treatment stream, that increased how much SRP was retained from five to 15%. And if so, if you are the manager of a lake or reservoir that's downstream from a river system, you want that organic matter in the stream to retain those nutrients before they uh, enter a lake or coastal zone. And then I like, I always like buy one, get one free. And, you know, as we connect land to water, streamside vegetation, we can do a lot with land use. Um, so that's not only cooling streams, but it's providing carbon sources. And other things that we're doing, you know, landscape wise, this cool image is from Freshwaters Illustrated, Jeremy Monroe. Um, you know, we really don't have very protective policies for non-point source pollution. And where, where, we get, you know, where we get those inputs is from the land. And so I think better land management is what it's all about. Also just, again, thinking upstream, downstream, a lot of action occurs in small streams, lots of biodiversity harbored there, nutrient uptake. And so anything that we wanna do to protect downstream systems, we have to start upstream. This is a really a compelling paper that came out in 2019, um, quantifying headwater streams make up almost 80% of river miles. And so all this dense blue are these um, small streams. I'm showing you Georgia and Kansas, just so you know where we both live, and then um, the star is where the Coweta experiments were conducted. So lots of tiny streams everywhere, and that really matters for um, what happens downstream. So I'm hoping that we can have a happier ending um, to this story, that the, these tools are right at our hands, and it's just whether there's um, the will to use them just reducing nutrient loading, I think is super important and maintaining riparian and, and watershed vegetation uh, will make for healthier streams. And I really wanna thank uh, my students uh, that have um, done so much to make all this possible. Um, a lot of undergraduates in our lab have a great experience because the graduate students have made that possible too. And here, um, 
Ali and Olivia just presented their research results April 4th at a, at a research event. Um, also my co-investigators and um, postdoc and, and research technicians uh, that have worked in my lab and uh, funding, you know, NSF funding for those experiments at Coweta and then the help through US Forest Service to run those things at Coweta and my beloved Society for Freshwater Science and the Odom School of Ecology and thanking you. <laughs>